Good morning. Welcome to Bayside. We are glad you're here today and just looking forward to uh, now getting into the Word. Uh, I'm Pastor Tom. I'm one of the pastors here at Bayside and have the privilege of being able to uh, share with you the Word and also, you know, share some pictures of my family because I just like to do that. Uh, so every once in a while, I'll just do that. And it's been a while since I've been able to uh, share my lovely family. My wife and I, Sarah, have four kids, two dogs, three chickens, and a crazy household. Uh, and so there's our four kids actually last fall. Uh, I don't know what kind of faces they're making. You just never know. I mean, you can take 30 pictures and you might get lucky to get one good one out of them. But uh, they look good there. Uh, and they're just being funny there with the, uh, all four of them. Uh, I guess I'll just go in order from left to right. Cade is our third. Then Josiah is our second. Garrison is the oldest. And then Malia, my daughter, which is still, I'm still getting used to that, having a daughter with three boys. Um, and so the next picture is more recent. I think this is our Easter picture. And there's my wife, Sarah. Uh, and you can see they're growing up and uh, getting older. And Malia is just starting to uh, steal all of the thunder from the boys. Um, you know, all of the attention goes to her, and rightfully so, right? <laughs> uh, and then the last picture you can see, she's, uh, man, that is just a great picture. That's my baby girl. Uh, that's Malia just a couple of weeks ago. And she's a beautiful blonde girl. I don't know how she got that blonde hair. I don't know how she has such good hair. Um, but... <laughs> I used to have a lot of hair. I used to have long hair, but not blonde hair. I don't know where that comes from. But anyway, um, that's my family, and that's my uh, daughter, and I'm just blessed to be able to raise those kids uh, with my wife, Sarah, here at this church. And so thank you for allowing me to share that with you and to just share my family with you. Um, boy, I am, I'm really thirsty. I just got up here, and I'm, I'm just uh, got a, kind of a parched throat. So I'm gonna, Kent, Kent is right there. Kent, would you get me a drink? Could you go grab me a drink, please? Oh, you already got a drink for me. Wow, look at this guy. What is that? A Diet Coke? <laughs> boy, oh boy. I just wanted a drink. Just brought me a Diet Coke. Want me to open it? Yeah, sure. It's going to open up. Can you get it? Oh, it's going to spill. Be careful. All right. You got it? Yeah, I got it. Let me get it sip. All right. Don't mind us. Ah, yeah, that tastes good. Yeah, it's good. Diet Coke. Who likes Diet Coke in here? We got a church that likes Diet Coke. I tell you what, we run out of Diet Coke like every two weeks in our pop machine, right? Mmm. That's really good. I'm not trying to get you to go buy pop from the pop machine, I promise. <laughs> Y'all recognize that, right? You can recognize Diet Coke, Coca-Cola. Mmm, it's good. Thank you, Kent. appreciate that. You know, it's kind of neat uh, that the access that we have, like you ask and you shall receive. It's kind of nice. I could just be like, hey, I'm thirsty, and I got direct access to a nice cold Coke. Thank you, Kent. Well, we're halfway through the year. We're halfway through 2018, right? It's been uh, six months already through. It's kind of crazy to think that it's past the 4th of July. We're moving on to the, it's going to be winter in like two weeks, right? I'm sorry to tell you that. <laughs> So I'm, I'm glad I got you all here because everyone else was smart enough not to come today. They're like out enjoying the warmth, right? No, I'm just kidding. But it is. Christmas is like in four weeks, and that's just how it goes, right? So let's enjoy this weather. But it's been halfway. I can't believe it's halfway through. And this year, our emphasis here at Bayside has been on prayer and the Word. If you've been here, I hope that you have heard us talking about how important prayer is and how important the word of Jesus Christ, the word of God is. And so I hope that you've been encouraged in that. And we've been digging into Colossians, right? We went through the whole book of Colossians, one verse at a time. And, and we've learned a lot. We learned that those who believe in Jesus Christ are in Jesus Christ. And that's given us confidence as we've learned more about that. And, and how do we walk out our faith? And how do we walk out our belief and faith in Jesus Christ? And so uh, we've been digging into the theology and the doctrine of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so as we did that, and as we started to think about transitioning from Colossians to another book, we thought, why not next go into the gospel? And so we're going to step into now and start studying the gospel and according to Mark, 
we're going to go into the gospel of Mark. You know, the gospel is the good news, right? You've heard that before, that the, the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. And Mark, the book of Mark, is one of the four gospels in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Most likely you're familiar with those four books. The book of Mark is also one of the three synoptic gospels. Maybe you haven't heard of that term. Synoptic gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And they're called the synoptic gospels because they have many of the same stories similar sequences of stories, and sometimes identical wording. Maybe you've noticed that when you read a story in Matthew, you also come across it in Mark, and it's like the same exact account, okay? And so they call Matthew, Mark, and Luke the synoptic gospels. The gospel of John is comparatively distinct. It's different. It's written differently. It has more relational side because of the relationship that John had with Jesus Christ. And so it's a little bit different. And, and so they call Matthew, Mark, and Luke the synoptic gospels. And so before we get into the book of Mark, I just want to talk a little bit about who was Mark. You know, we're not 100% sure because this, this book was written about 2,000 years ago. Some scholars believe that the author of this gospel was John Mark, whom we later read about in that book of Acts and who accompanies Paul and Barnabas on their missionary journeys. This Mark is also known as Mark the Evangelist. Okay? That's the same Mark who was the cousin of Barnabas and mentioned in Colossians chapter 4, verse 10, as Paul gives his instructions to the church. And so we just read about that. Two weeks ago, we were reading about this Mark that, that Paul was encouraging the Colossians to, to greet and to pray over and all those things. We just read that two weeks ago, and now likely this might be the guy who wrote that. We're not 100% sure. We can't say with 100% confidence. Scholars believe that it could be that same man that wrote the Gospel of Mark. Some scholars don't identify with that author, and they identify that the author of this Gospel is probably just an anonymous um, uh, uh, unknown Mark other than in this position, writing this book. And so we're not 100% sure, but either way, that gives us an idea of who this could have been, who Mark may have been, as he wrote this gospel account of the life of Jesus Christ. So we're going to start today in the beginning. So open up with me to Mark chapter 1. It's on page 836 in your pew Bible. If you open up, uh, if you don't have a Bible today, we encourage you to grab the Bible from the pew in front of you or underneath your uh, chair and join us in opening up to page 836, Mark chapter 1. And as you do that, I want to encourage you today. Is, today, I really, as I prayed and, and thought about and looked over this scripture, I really thought about the two things that stuck out. And so I want you to listen for two words that we're going to dig deeper into today that I think will have a strong impact, and I hope, and I'm praying, will have a strong impact on each and every one of us today as we read and as we begin this journey into the book of Mark. So Mark chapter 1, starting with verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The beginning of the gospel. Gospel. The first word that I want to focus on today is gospel. I want to take a look at the original meaning of the Greek word that Mark uses for gospel. It is the word iagilion. I'm not going to say it twice. Don't try and pronounce it. It's a tough word. Iagilion. I did say it twice. There you go. Gospel. It means good tidings, glad tidings of salvation through Christ, proclamation of the grace of God through Christ, the gospel. It's the good news. You see, it's important for us to understand the gospel as we jump into the narrative of the gospel of Jesus Christ according to Mark. We must understand what the gospel means, what the gospel is. If we don't, then it's kind of useless and pointless for us to read through this account of Jesus Christ and the gospel of Christ, if we don't even know what gospel means. So have you heard the gospel? Have you read the gospel? Have you lived the gospel? 
all important questions as we dive into the beginning of the gospel. You see, we here in America, we are fortunate. We have access to the gospel. We have churches. We have Bibles. We have Christians living around us. Americans really have no excuse because we have easy access to the gospel of Jesus Christ. As easy as me getting a Diet Coke from Kent this morning. Easy access. Most likely we have heard the gospel many times in our lifetime. You've heard people talk about Jesus Christ many times in your lifetime. If you haven't and this is your first time today, I hope you keep coming because you're going to hear about Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ every time you come into this building. Not everyone in this world could be so fortunate. Did you know that there's 7,000 unreached people groups in this world? An unreached people group is considered to be a people group, an ethnicity that has little or no access to the gospel of Jesus Christ. 7,000 people groups have little or no access to the gospel of Jesus Christ, which we take for granted every day. And of those 7,000 unreached people groups, there are 3,000 unreached unengaged people groups. And you ask, what does that mean? Those 3,000 people groups, not only do they have little or no access to the gospel, nobody is even trying to bring them the gospel. 3,000 people groups that nobody is even attempting to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to them. They have no opportunity to hear the gospel, which you get to hear Every single day that you open your word, every single time you walk into this building, they have no access. And no one is even trying to get the gospel to them. You take all those people and all those people groups, and it adds up to be 33% of the world's population. 33% of this world has little to no access to the gospel No churches, no Bibles, no Christians, and no one even trying to bring them the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's 7.6 billion people on this earth. That means that over 2 billion people have not heard the gospel and have no opportunity to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and have nobody bringing and trying to bring the gospel to them. We are fortunate in America. Please do not take for granted that you have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. That you have access to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm as guilty as the next person, but many of us have these collecting dust in our homes, on our bookshelves, in our cars, in our churches. And over 2 billion people in this world don't have access. It's the gospel. I want to shift gears now. That's staggering information. I hope that that hits you hard. It hit me hard when I started thinking about that. And we're not done talking about that, but I want to shift gears and continue on now, reading verses 2 through 8. So Mark chapter 1, 2 through 8, he continues on. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. 
And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He's talking about Jesus Christ. I love John the Baptist's humility as he prepares the way for the Lord. There were prophecies in the Old Testament about the one that was going to prepare the way, the messenger that was going to come and set the tone and prepare the country and prepare the world for Jesus Christ, the Messiah. John the Baptist was that prophet that was to come. And here he is appearing. According to Mark, he appears and he starts preaching and teaching a baptism of repentance and the forgiveness of sins. And everyone starts hearing it. It stirs up the country and stirs up the people and they start coming out and they start being baptized. And he starts gathering up a following of disciples and followers of John the Baptist. And so right away he stops them and he says, no, you see, I'm baptizing you with water, but there's one to come who I'm not worthy of who's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And that's Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And we'll learn much more about him as we continue to dig into the book of Mark. But today, I just want to look a little bit about what John the Baptist, who he is and what he's saying and what he's doing. John the Baptist is a curious character from the Bible. We can learn much about him from other scriptures. Luke even counts his mother as a relative of Mary, the mother of Jesus. You see, John the Baptist kind of just appeared. He kind of came out of nowhere. He, he came out of the wilderness and, and all of a sudden starts preaching and teaching it. And the word starts to spread quickly. Many people confessed their sins and were baptized. John proclaimed a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. This too is vital for us to establish as we begin looking at the gospel of Jesus Christ through the eyes of Mark. Repentance. Repentance is the second word that I want to look at. Why is repentance important? What is repentance? Again, we want to look at the original Greek word that Mark used for repentance. It's the word metanoia. It means a change of mind of a purpose he has formed or one has formed or of something he has done. A change of purpose, a change of something you have formed or a change of something you have done. A life change, that's repentance, a life change. When you heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, did you repent? Was there a life change? And maybe not for every one of us, the first time that we heard the gospel, there was repentance. Many times we need to hear the gospel and and God will work and the Holy Spirit will work on our hearts. And at some point, there must be a life change. At some point, there must be repentance. The grace of God is a gift. And when we receive that gift, we repent. Was there repentance when you heard the gospel of Jesus Christ? And why is that important? The Bible says that we must grieve our sin. You need to repent of your sins. We must grieve our sins first. God grieves our sins. Do we grieve our sins? We must grieve our sins. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Godly grief over our sin produces repentance, repentance that leads to salvation, and salvation without regret. I want you to think about something that's very convicting. Do you have regret over the things in this world that you give up as a Christian? Amen. Amen. That should be our answer, but it's not. We have to think about that. Think about that today. Do you have worldly grief? Worldly grief produces death, it says in 2 Corinthians 7.10. It's a dead end. 
You might feel sorry for the bad thing that you've done. You might feel sorry for your sin, but you get over it. That's worldly grief. You might feel bad about it, but it doesn't change your life. Godly grief leads to repentance, life change. The grace of God is so good. He loves us so much. His mercy and grace is so good that it causes us when we see it and we understand it and we know it and we believe it and we put our faith in Christ and his word. It causes us to have this grief over the terrible things that we've done, that we, that we continue to do and that we will do. And then to repent over those things. Godly grief produces repentance and earnestness and eagerness and zeal. Verse 11 of that same scripture in 2 Corinthians 7, 11, it, it, Paul says, For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you. But what also, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal. See, Paul's talking about a life change, a heart change. Repentance is a change of heart. Repentance is at the very heart of salvation. Genuine faith. Genuine faith in Jesus Christ leads to godly grief of one sin, which leads to repentance. Have you taken seriously your access to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think here in America, we take for granted the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it has caused us to be lazy. It has caused us to be indifferent to our sin, to our behavior, to our lifestyles. Today, I ask you, have you taken seriously your acceptance of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Have you repented in response to the gospel of Jesus Christ? Church, it is time to check our hearts. Change your mind. Change your heart. Change your life. I'm telling you today, as you can see with great conviction that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the most important thing you will ever hear, know, or understand in this lifetime. Are you taking your access to the gospel seriously? Did you hear earlier when I shared those numbers? Did you really hear those numbers? 33% of the world's population has no access to the gospel. No churches, no Bibles, no Christians, no gospel. Over 2 billion people on this earth have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. You want to hear something even crazier than that? 97% of the world's population has access to Coca-Cola. Ninety-seven percent of this world can get to a Coca-Cola classic or even a Diet Coke. Coca-Cola brags about that. On their website, they say that 94 percent of the world recognizes their logo. It's the most recognized logo in the world. Every one of you, when you saw this, hand it to me. You knew it was a Diet Coke. Or if it would have been a red Coke, you would have known exactly what it was. The whole world, 97%. That's like 7 billion people. They know and recognize Coke, and they have access to it. And just think about that. All over the world, in the farthest reaches, the farthest countries, on the mountainsides, the hillsides, the deserts, all over the world, 97% of the world can get a Coke. Yet we haven't reached 2 billion people yet with the gospel of Jesus Christ.
I share these things with great conviction to you today, not to make you feel guilty, but because it stirred up in me a renewed fire and passion for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as a church, if we're going to talk about the gospel and we're going to read through Colossians and learn all about the theology and the doctrine of the gospel of Jesus Christ as a church, and now we're going to step into and read through and study the gospel of Jesus Christ according to Mark, it's important and it's vital for us to understand what is at stake. Think about those numbers for a moment. For the love of money, Coca-Cola has spread their company to the furthest reaches of this world. And they've done it in just over a hundred and some years. And for 2,000 years, we've had opportunity to share the gospel. And boy, we've done a pretty good job. But when you think about what Coke's done, we got work to do. You know, Jesus says that when he left this earth, he said, go and make disciples. He told his, his followers, he said, go into Jerusalem, go into Judea, even go into Samaria, and then go all over the world to all nations, all people groups, all ethnicities, and tell them about Jesus Christ. And he said, I'm not coming back until every people group, every nation has heard. And so when you hear people saying it's the end times, it's the end of the world because there's earthquakes and there's all sorts of bad things happening, it ain't the end times because there's still 7,000 people groups that haven't heard the name of Jesus Christ. So I'm telling you today, it's not the end times until we get moving, until we start spreading the gospel, until we start making disciples of all the nations because Jesus promised he's coming back but he's not coming back until every nation has had an opportunity to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. So church, we've got work to do. We've got work to do. There's two reasons I share these things with you today. I was convicted when I started reading the gospel of Mark. And just a week ago, Mark Brookwell and I, we went, the pastors here at Bayside, we went to a conference called the REACH Conference. It was a conference of uh, all of our churches here that we are affiliated with at Bayside. It's uh, called Converge Worldwide. It's all the Baptist churches in our affiliation, our denomination. And we had this conference, and, and it was a lot of emphasis on the gospel and on spreading the gospel and on reaching here in your church, across the street, and around the world. And we're going to continue to share things from what we learned and how Bayside Baptist Church can continue to be a part of this movement to reach more and more people, to reach more and more nations with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are part of a movement of about 1,300 churches that are stepping out into this world, trying to reach the unreached and trying to reach the unengaged people groups of this world. And so I want you to begin praying, joining us in prayer for this. How can we, as a church, be a part of this movement of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who don't know? It starts individually with each and every one of us. Because, yeah, there's probably people that you know in your life that maybe have access to the gospel, and their access is you Think about that a moment. Maybe their only access is their connection to you. So it starts with each one of us individually. Spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ by living it and by telling people about it. And so I, I encourage you, I challenge you, I urge you to prayerfully consider who in your life needs access to the gospel that you know to the gospel that you've heard, to the gospel that you have easy access to, as easy as getting a Coke. Start praying for those. Start praying how you can share the gospel in your life around your connections that you have. 
And then secondly, to pray for us as a church and how we will support and be a part of sending people into the unreached and unengaged people groups of this world so that more and more people will come to know Jesus Christ, will hear and have access to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we will not stop until the whole world hears because Jesus said, I will return when the whole world has had opportunity to hear. So would you join us in those two things? Number one, praying for your life, in your life, those connections that you have, those people in your life who their access to the gospel is you. And then join us in praying for how we as a church will join this movement to reach the unreached, to reach the unengaged. 33% of the world's population has no access to the gospel. Think about that today. The gospel truth is a matter of life and death. And so as we get into the book of Mark, reflect upon the gospel and upon repentance and how it has changed your life. If it hasn't changed your life, then I urge you to pray today for that change. Pray for repentance today. And then begin praying how you can spread the gospel of Jesus Christ until the whole world hears. Let's pray. Father, convict our hearts today. Break our hearts today, Lord, for what your heart breaks for. God, I just can't imagine the numbers and numbers of nations and people groups and just people in general that have never even heard the name Jesus Christ. God, I pray that you would urge us, convict us, move us to take seriously the gospel of Jesus Christ. Today in our daily life and tomorrow, however, we can reach this world. God, we thank you. I thank you over and over again, Lord. I thank you so much for blessing me and blessing us with access to your gospel, with opportunity to hear your gospel over and over again, to, to open your word and to read it every single day. I thank you. And I pray that we will never take that for granted. And so today I pray that we won't be guilt-ridden by your message this morning, but we will be encouraged and passionate and fired up and excited to share the gospel with everyone we know and to do everything we can to pray and to support and to send people to make more disciples of every nation until this whole world has had opportunity to hear the name of Jesus Christ. God, we won't stop until everyone knows, until everyone hears. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. Put a fire in our hearts today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.